All right, so after a lot of me running my mouth, we finally have our G-code. Now we just hit the start button, kick up our feet, and let it do its thing. I couldn't tell you why exactly, but I thought I'd sit down and try to knock out a very basic CNC video. Essentially just the big picture. And by big picture, I mean really big. I'm going to do this from a hobbyist's perspective. And really just the workflow. Sort of the main steps and thought process to get from an idea in your head to a part in your hand. If you end up with a part in your head, you did it wrong. We'll be talking about Mach 3 based, low cost, entry level CNC machines. I'll get into what that means later, but if you're running a Mori or a Daytron, you might not be in the right place. If you are running one of those come Monday morning, and you're looking for help on YouTube, all I can say is, good luck my friend, good luck. I'll be doing this on a CNC router, because frankly that's all I have. But these basics go with more or less any CNC, be it lathe, mill, router, 3D printer, plasma cutter, etc. Fundamentally they're all the same. They are robots that obey your every command. Quite literally, every command. Word for word. And that's usually where the problems come in. You inadvertently tell to do something stupid, and it does it. Scrapping your part, or breaking something, or both. The general outline for this video will look something like this. CAD, CAM, CNC. Only backwards. We'll start with the machine, and work our way back to what it takes to become an overlord. Chapter 3. CNC Machines. I happen to have built my own, a CNC router, because I have an illness. There are a lot of options out there, more than I could list here, but ballpark, at the time of this video, you could get an import CNC3020, a Shapeoko, an X-Carve, 3501 or equivalent, or maybe a Tormach 440. Some of these are routers, some are mills, all depends on what you need to do. I can't recommend any particular one, as I have not used them. But again, do your homework based on what you think you'd like to make, and the budget you may or may not have. To get a handle on the CNC machine itself, let's keep this simple and just talk two dimensions for now. By way of non-copyright infringing analogy, let's use a CNC -a sketch. I'm sure everyone's familiar with one of these. You have two knobs, and depending on how you turn them, you end up with different drawings. In our case, our knobs would be controlled with motors. You don't turn them yourself. I mean, what kind of overlord would you be if you did? A computer turns the motors, and a CNC machine might have three, four, five, or more motors depending on the machine. But here we're working in two dimensions, so we only need two. X and Y. One for each knob. For argument's sake, let's draw a simple square. Say, two inches by two inches. We'd start off by telling the motor that runs the left-right knob, or X, to move two inches to the right. Once it's there, we'd tell the up-down knob, Y, to move two inches up. Y then stops there, and X takes over again, moving 2 inches to the left, where Y picks up and moves 2 inches down. We now have the square we've always dreamed of. Now if we were to write this out explicitly, it might look something like this. X2, Y2, X-2, Y-2. That's one command for each line that we drew, telling the machine which axis we want to move, and the amount. In this case, either positive 2 inches or negative 2 inches. If you were to write x2, y2, for example, all on the same line, you'd be asking both motors to run at the same time, turning both knobs simultaneously, and you'd end up with a diagonal line. What you just witness is technically called a train wreck. G-code. I mean, not exactly, but sort of. I hope you get the idea. We wrote out the instructions that we want our CNC machine to follow. Now you could save that and use it again later or send it to your friends and they could draw squares all day long exactly the same as yours. Now, CNC instructions, or G-code, are much more literal than that. Remember, we're talking to a dumb machine here. There are quite a few things we took for granted. For example, where on the screen should the square start, and at which of the four corners? How fast should it draw it? What should the machine do before and after it's done drawing? Does your Etch-a-Sketch require coolant? The list goes on and on. Now, while I'd wholeheartedly recommend learning G-code, it's not strictly necessary. In all likelihood, if you're a hobbyist, you won't be writing your own G-code. You're the overlord, remember? But if you know it, it'll be easier for you to spot where a mistake happened or to make changes a lot faster. For example, if you wanted a certain part to go slower, you could edit just the line that sets the speed instead of having to redo your entire program. Chapter 3 Recap 
CNC machines are very stupid. CNC machines require explicit instructions about what to do and how to do it. Those instructions are called G-code. Chapters 1 and 2 CAD and CAM So in order to get our CNC machine to do anything, we need to give it very precise instructions. We need to give it G-code. A CNC controller would take that G-code and sequentially send it to the machine line by line to execute the steps you've asked for, moving the tool, slowly making your part. In our case, the CNC controller is Mach 3. Mach 3 is a program that runs on a personal computer. Think of it like a virtual controller. Mach 3 is probably the number one reason hobbyists have access to the CNC world. So how do you get the G-code that makes your part? As I mentioned, you probably won't be writing your own G-code explicitly. But G-code doesn't exactly write itself either. I mean, it sort of does, but not really. In some situations, machinists or manufacturing engineers do write their own G-code to solve a particular problem or do something their software might not easily allow them to do. I'm not sure what that is, but it happens. To generate G-code, you'll need some sort of CAM software. CAM software can be anything from simple one-trick ponies, such as wizards that might cut a circle or a pocket or a bolt hole pattern, to very sophisticated software packages that can run multiple motors simultaneously doing highly efficient 3D toolpaths. As any viewer out there that might enjoy skinning cats probably already knows, there is more than one way to do it. Same goes with G-code. Some G-code is better than others at getting a particular job done. It could be more efficient, meaning it'll make the same part as a similar program in less time with less tool wear, etc. But as hobbyists, we're usually not worried about that sort of thing. As long as the code makes our part, even if it did have to snap its way through three or four end mills, we're more or less happy. Despite both having three letters, CAD and CAM are two very different and independent things. CAD is what you'd use to actually draw what you'd like the CNC machine to make. CAD is what you see me doing right now. CAM takes that CAD model and turns it into instructions that the machine controller can understand. Fundamentally, whether you draw it yourself, you have someone else do it, you download it, you need some model or sketch for the CAM software to turn into G-code. Which CAD and CAM package you decide to use is up to what you need to make, and to some extent, personal preference. Broad suggestions are difficult to make, but if I had to make a recommendation at the time of this video, it would have to be Fusion 360. You're looking at Fusion 360 right now. I'd recommend Fusion for two very big reasons. First, for hobbyists and enthusiasts, it's free. Second, in addition to a lot of other great tools, it does both CAD and CAM all under one roof. The only downside to this recommendation is that Fusion is a very big hammer. It might be more than you need, and that might be intimidating. But, bang for the buck, it's hard to beat. Anyway, back to the show. Let's just walk through a simple project start to finish and keep track of the steps. Let's say, for argument's sake, you've got a booth at the county fair, and you think pig-shaped cutting boards would really rake it in. Because, you know, if you're going to make a cutting board, might as well make it as cruel and ironic as possible. The first thing we'll need is a drawing. You'll need some CAD. I think you'll have just watched me draw a really delicious looking pig. Just a sketch. Technically the sketch is all we need, but we'll extrude it to the thickness of the stock that we'll be cutting it out of, so it's easier to visualize. Once happy with the CAD, you'd move into your CAM software. In the case of Fusion, we simply switch to the CAM module, as they like to call it. This is where we start to set things up for our G-code export. Now, this isn't a Fusion video, so I'm just covering the basic workflow. For some good Fusion, head over to John's channel at NYC CNC. You'd start off with a new setup in the CAM module. The setup is just what it sounds like, setting up some basic info the CNC machine will need. In this case, the wood blank I'll be cutting the pig out of, and setting the orientation of that blank on the table and specifying the origin basically telling the machine where I'll be starting. Personally, I like to use the rear left corner, top side of the work, on my machine. But as long as you and your router are on the same page, it doesn't really matter. Now the router will know where to go when it's told to move, say, X two inches to the right. At this point, it's got enough information that we can start building instructions for the machine, the tool paths it should execute to make the part that we want. Depending on the shape of your part, you have quite a few options in Fusion to choose from. You might see them listed across the top here. In the case of the cutting board, we only need one operation. And a 2D contour should work fine. 
In the 2D Contour dialog box, we'll need to tell it what tool we're using. Here I'm picking a quarter inch flat bottom end mill from the library. It'll be a carbide router bit for wood, but as long as all the information is correct, the CNC won't know the difference. I could put an eyeliner brush in the spindle for all it cares. Next, I'll pick the 2D contour I'd like it to cut and make sure the little red arrow is on the right side. Again, it doesn't really know the difference between a cutout or a pocket, so that's up to you. I'll make sure the working heights of the machine are correct and set the bottom of the toolpath to the bottom of my wood blank, since in this case I'd like to cut all the way through. At that point, I can tweak a few options, such as how many passes I'd like it to make before it goes all the way through, and in this case, set up some tabs so the part doesn't fly out prematurely. Tabs are just small connections to the board that the router will leave uncut. Once we're done there, we'll see a preview of the toolpath we're about to have it generate for us. This is usually enough for me, but if you'd like, you can have Fusion simulate the whole cut. Finally, I like to have a look at the machining time, just so I know what I'm in for. In this case, if all goes well, four to five minutes should do it. Once happy, I can generate the G-code. This is called post-processing. In this dialog box, we'd select the type of machine we're generating the G-code for. I've selected Mach 3 from the drop-down list, and away it goes. You can see this G-code is only slightly longer than the code we needed to draw the square. And that's it, we now have instructions for our CNC machine. We'll take these instructions and feed them into the controller, in this case Mach 3, and we should be ready to go. At the CNC machine now, and we're looking at the Mach 3 screen. I've already loaded the G-code we've generated with the Load G-code button. You can see the code up on the left and the toolpaths over on the right. The first thing we'll want to make sure to do is reference the machine. Ref All Home button. This sends the machine out to reference all of its axes, in my case, X, Y, and Z, one at a time. Referencing tells the machine how big it is and essentially where the cutting tool is in that envelope. Like the name implies, it establishes the machine's reference frame for the work we're about to ask it to do. We can now load our material. How you do this depends on the job you're doing and your material, of course, but usually you'd use a vise, hold downs, screws, double-sided tape, a vacuum table, the sky's the limit. As long as it doesn't move under the cutting forces, all will be well. I'm mounting mine to a wooden riser that also serves as a sacrificial board. If I'd mount it directly to the table, I might risk cutting into my table, damaging the tool, or probably both. If we weren't cutting all the way through, this wouldn't matter. With the right tool in the spindle, I'll move it to the same starting point we specified earlier in the CAM software. Again, in my case, the left rear top corner. And now I can zero out the DROs in Mach 3. This tells Mach 3 and the machine where to start executing the G-code, sort of in that available envelope we established earlier by referencing the axes. When ready, I hit the cycle start button and let her rip. The machine now executes all the instructions we prescribed in the CAM software, working its way through all the G-code line by line. Mach 3 updates the DROs and the toolpath display as it's running. And that's about it. That's the big picture. Now, any one of these steps I showed you here is a rabbit hole in itself. You can and will find videos and information online on just about every step in this video. But hopefully this gives you a bit of perspective on how everything is supposed to work. And one last tip. If you do plan to make your fortune with cutting boards, don't use plywood. Anyway, hope that helped. And as always, thanks for watching.